Welcome to Rebuilding the Beast. Jenna, thank you so much for joining me. I, I'm so grateful. Uh, this is my first po official podcast, and um, I'm really excited to have you. So you're almost going to be coaching me a little bit because you're, you're no, <laughs> no stranger to the podcast world. No, that's for sure. Yeah. I listened to a couple of your, of your messages today, and uh, I'm just blown away. I'm blown away by your vulnerability, so I'm excited to get into your story. Uh, we want to hear more about you and how you got into loving your body and how you can teach mm -hmm. us to love our bodies. So tell me a little bit of your story and, and how you got into this world of, of body positivity. Yeah, well, it really started with the opposite of being obsessed with looking a certain way for over a decade. I was 16 and I decided, you know what, I'm just going to start working out more and eating better. And it was a really innocent beginning. And I think it, that sounds so positive and sounds so great, but it was all in the name of weight loss and to look like I thought I was supposed to. And so I went down that road for 10 years and I did lose a significant amount of weight to start because that's how bodies work. At first, that is very effective. Yeah. Um, so I lost a, bottom, a bunch of weight, was getting praise left and right from high school teachers and friends and boys were starting to pay attention to me and it was like the world telling me yes you're better this way you are more valuable this way and we see you now so it was a very clear message I was getting when I lost weight um, and then eventually uh, I started modeling I went overseas I was living in Cape Town South Africa for a little while uh, modeling there in 2010 and then I went back in 2012 and of course, that just fuels the fire of <laughs> you, have to, you have to be perfect. You have to look this very specific way. It's never good enough. And I, find, I came back from my second modeling trip, just kind of like, where do I go from here? Like that is, this is not something I can keep up. It was never good enough. So I, I knew that this wasn't something I could do long term. And so I went back to school and became a school teacher. That was great. It really showed me, oh, I am worth more than just looking a certain way. I can... <laughs> I really, so, okay, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. So I really, um, when it comes to body image, it's something that even me, myself, I've gone through my fair share of changes, right? As a young kid, I was a, I was a chubby young kid and I didn't really, you know, I wasn't a, an athlete of any kind. You know, I didn't play, I was kind of a nerdy kid. And it wasn't until later I discovered basketball that I started working out, I started training. But the idea of food, and I'm still learning, actually, even till this age, I'm still learning what it means to eat healthy. And it's funny because even in the world of basketball, in the world of athletes, there's people who don't like their bodies. I was blessed with the fact that I was able to, to train and work out. And I got, the, you know, I got a, an athlete body and then I got to go work it out. But I would love to learn what changes you what changes did you go through that made you feel like okay i am getting closer to where i need to be how did you you know going from the kid that you were what what was your body type as a kid before you started working out um i was just kind of normal <laughs> i don't know normal. You'd, yeah you'd probably call i at the time and that's what's funny is now i now that i've repaired my relationship with bodies and i realized that media doesn't portray what a real body is. I thought that was normal, like really thin and fit and just the, the what we're shown on TV all the time. Every main character looks the same. They're all thin. <laughs> They're all tall, white, long hair, like very traditional image. And so I thought that was normal. And me being not exactly that, I mean, I'm not far off, but I was chubby. So I was like, oh, there's all these things wrong with me. I got to fix it. Now that I realize humans are so diverse, we all have different body sizes and it's supposed to be that way. There's nothing wrong with people in larger bodies. We're not all supposed to be the girl in the magazine. Now I realize I was just normal. <laughs> yeah. I was just a per perfectly adorable teenager that was just herself. And so, but when I real, but the real, real, aha moment came when after 10 years of working so hard like I remember people commenting because I'd be in the gym they're like oh are you are you training for a competition or a fitness competition I'm like no I'm just working out because I was so obsessed with wow you were working that hard 
just to look a certain way, just to be accepted, just to be praised. And it was not from a healthy place. It was not from, oh, I want to be fit and strong and feel great. No, it was, I want to look like that because that's what society has told me is the right way to look. And so one, like there was a couple instances when I really realized like, I have never for one day felt like I'm here. Not one day did I feel this is the body I was working towards. I'm done. Really? I can now live my life. It was Even as never, a model, you didn't feel no. that way. I look Isn't at pictures crazy? now, I'm like, I was clearly in a bad mind space because now I look at myself I'm like, oh my God, I was so thin. And now I've had, now I don't diet anymore. I don't work to be thin anymore. And I've had two children. So of course I looked much different than I did when I was modeling. And I'm more accepting of myself now than I was when I was at my thinnest and modeling. So it's all about mindset. And that's what I really learned of nobody's going to, nobody is going <laughs> to give me that feeling I'm looking for, which is contentment, peace, feeling like I'm whole, being enough, no weight loss, no, no matter what I look like, that's never the, going to be the path to happiness. Wow, that's, so that's, when, that's beautiful. Your, your podcast is called How to Love Your Body, and you created a concept of undieting. And so now we're talking about dieting and how you don't diet anymore. Um, explain that to me a little briefly. Yeah, so I mean, it's all based in intuitive eating is kind of the basis of our work, which just means listen to your body. When you're dieting, you're doing everything but listening to your body. You're starving, but oh, it doesn't matter. It's not on my meal plan. And you're letting an outside source tell you how to eat and when you should eat and how much you should eat when our bodies are all very diverse. And so what we teach is how to listen to your own body. What is your body craving? How much does it need? Are you full? Okay, stop. Like It's not that complicated. Eating shouldn't be this hard. It should just be very simple, just like any other bodily sensation. If you're cold, you put on a sweater. If you have to go to the bathroom, you go. It's not a big ordeal. Whereas when we're hungry, we freak out because am I eating the right thing? Is it healthy enough? Is it the right macros? Is it the right calories? And that is really considered disordered eating. But because our culture is so normalized to obsess about what you're eating, yes. feel guilty about what you've eaten. Oh, I shouldn't eat that. Now I've got to go work it off at the gym. Like that is not a healthy relationship with food, um, but it's what we've all been taught. So of course, that's pretty typical. So this, this podcast is called Rebuilding the Beast. And, you know, we're talking about rebuilding your body, rebuilding your mind, rebuilding your story. There is always something that everybody is going through. There's a constant rebuild of some sort. And even the, in Corona, right, we, we were all stuck at home and we had a new relationship with food because now it's just here. We're not at work where we have to be somewhere. It's here all the time. And I had a lot of my friends who were athletes as well talk about, man, I, I don't know what to do. I, I, I got to go on a diet. And even I tried a few diets. What has been your relationship with um, the different diets? Do you remember your first, you remember your history, um, your first diet that you went on? Um, mm -hmm. Do you remember the first time you went on a diet? Well, that when I was 16, it literally was so weird. I just woke up one day being like, I'm going to do this. And then I did it for 10 years. <laughs> um, wow. But at first it was very gentle. And I think that's what a lot of people find like, oh, I'm just going to be a little healthier. I'm just going to watch what I eat. I'm just going to start going to the gym. But if the focus is on the way you look or weight loss in particular, pursuing weight loss, it, I find it almost always gets more and more obsessive because you got to do more to get any results because your body is a brilliant being and it's trying to have you not lose weight. Because if we were out in the in the forest like we were hundreds of years ago you don't want to lose weight you want to keep the weight on so our bodies haven't caught up with modern times it our bodies don't know there's a restaurant on every corner so if you're not giving your body enough food your body is not happy and it will hold on to weight so uh it gets harder and harder as you diet but yeah i did that for 10 years on and off um i started binge eating because i wasn't eating enough so i would eat really good all week and then uh -huh in private binge eat on the weekends and then start again and pretend like nothing happened and there's a lot of shame and guilt and so many people experience this but we're taught 
hey, you should be able to restrict your food, you should be able to diet, you should be able to pursue weight loss and have success. So if you're having problems, that's your issue. But no, it's a biological response. If your body's not getting enough food and we have high, we have a lot of access to food, most people. Um, so yeah, you're, you're going to have a moment of weakness and say, and you, then your body like takes over and you're like, why am I eating all this? I'm not even hungry. And it feels so horrible, but it's natural. You have to feed yourself enough in order to find peace with food. And that's what I have found in, in this, uh, in the pandemic, everyone's like, oh, food, food. Me and Lauren, who do this work together, we're like, no different to me. I always joke. Sorry, I always joke I could live in a grocery store and it wouldn't affect the way I eat because my relationship, my relationship with food is healed. I just eat what I want when I want it. And naturally, if someone has a healthy relationship with food, it looks pretty balanced in the end. I still eat chocolate every day. I have desserts. I have pizza. I also have smoothies and salads and. I just eat like a normal person. <laughs> so let me tell you my, a little bit of my transition. So when I was a kid, I used to eat until, I just wanted to eat everything that felt good, right? And I've kind of noticed that a lot of things that feel good are usually not that great for you, right? So whether it's like ice cream, I would eat ice cream until I couldn't eat ice cream anymore and chocolates and cereals and all these things. And I'm never one to tell people, even till now, as I've discovered all the different kinds of diets to figure out as an athlete, you want to optimize your production in, in, in your sport. And so you try these different diets to see how it works for you as an athlete. But I always tell people this when they reach out to me, I say that you can eat what you want. It's not about, it's not about cutting everything off or it's about eating things in moderation. And a lot of times, you know, like I, as, a, as a kid, I would eat until I was really, really full, which is all the way up here. And you're not, that's, it doesn't make you feel good, right? And so how did you realize, how did you, how did you realize, how did you work on your diet? What was it that made you figure out the optimal thing that you're, and, and what is your optimal diet right now? Well, I think that's what's really interesting is this is such a different way of thinking that that question doesn't truly relate because I listen to my body, meaning like you said, okay, when you're young, you eat all this food. Well, that wasn't listening to your body because it didn't feel good yeah. afterwards. And so what we focus on is, okay, what's going to feel good and taste good. So yeah, of course, sometimes I'll eat something and I'm like, oh, that was a little bit too much dessert, but that's human. Like it's never going to be perfect. But a lot of times I'll know like, oh, I'm pretty full from dinner. I don't want any dessert, but it's not, I shouldn't, I can't. It's going to, oh, I'll ruin my healthy day if I eat the dessert. The psychology behind food is so complex. And so even when, even when people teach like in moderation, Okay, so tell someone they can only have co two cookies. They've never wanted three cookies more in their life. <laughs> yeah, but, if you, but if you tell them, oh, ha have some cookies and see how you feel. And they might find one is perfect. It's so interesting. If you, a really big part of intuitive eating is allowing all food unconditionally, meaning you can truly have as much as you want. There's no shame, no guilt, no shoulds, no have tos, no good and bad. Just tune into how you feel. And it's so amazing. We have a group running right now and uh, the women in there are like, oh, I told myself I could only have two cookies, even though I was allowing them, I still gave myself a limit and then I ate a whole row. Whereas when I said, okay, you know what? I can have as many as I want. Let's see how many feels good. And they're like, oh, one was enough. It's so interesting, the psychology behind it where it's so different from our culture diet culture that it seems scary and seems to make no sense at first but the change in thinking around food is what makes food just food like I honestly whatever just make me dinner I don't care what it is and I'll eat it and move on whereas someone who's dieting or thinking I have to eat in this special way food becomes such an obsession like when I was dieting I thought okay I have to eat healthy I got to be thin I got to pursue weight loss I got to be perfect God, I thought about food when I woke up. I thought about lunch while I was eating breakfast. I thought about food when I went to bed. Now I just think about food when I'm hungry and then I go make a meal and I eat it and I carry on. Like food is just food. And so right now for myself, 
that just means whatever's kind of in the fridge from groceries because I have two kids under two. I don't really have time to worry too much about everything being perfect or eating exactly what I want. It's just, okay, oh, here's leftovers from dinner. We're heating that up. That's lunch carrying on with our day. But it's really cool to have food and exercise as a part of that too um, as just a small part of my life that fuels my life instead of it being my life, mm. which dieters, I mean, if anyone listening to this has been on a diet before, that diet takes over your life. Like if you're trying to be really meticulous with what you eat and how you work out, it kind of crowds everything else out and then you're not living. So that's what we teach is how to make food and exercise just a small part of your life that helps your life, but it isn't everything. So, okay, like I told you before, I'm a little nervous. And so um, as, as we're talking, you're actually helping me calm down. I, I love this idea of food and dieting, and I really would love to know, and, and I want to back up for a second. I would love to know, how did you get from the kid who was obsessed with food to hearing what you're saying right now, which is somebody who just has a loving relationship? I, the idea that you can be put in the middle of a, of a grocery store and it wouldn't change your diet plan. I don't know that every American or every Canadian would have that relationship because as you can see from the Corona times, when the people found out there was not, there might be a shortage, they started buying things that they wouldn't even normally buy, right? It's just crazy. We, we don't, you know, um, it changes our relationship. When you know it's there, when it's not there, it, the things we eat change. So how did you get to a place in your mind where it's like, okay, regardless, I'm eating what I like or what I need or how did it, how did you get there? Absolutely. Well, that, exactly what you just said is the scarcity mindset and that's how dieting works. Mm. So if you're on a diet, oh, I can only have this much. I can only have this much. Your brain ruminates over that and it feels like there's scarcity. So when you do cheat or fail or say, screw it, I'm just going to eat everything in the house and start again tomorrow. That's the scarcity mindset. Exactly like with, with the pandemic and toilet paper. <gasps> toilet paper is scarce. I better go buy 50 packages <laughs> when normally you would not care about that. That is exactly how dieting works. Toilet paper is just toilet paper until someone tells you there's not much available. Food is just food until, until someone tells you, oh, you can't have very much of that you become obsessed. You And then when it is available, it's like a hoarding, like you just want to hoard it. You want to keep it all. You want to eat it all right now. Whereas an abundant mindset with food, meaning that, that psychology of you truly can eat as much as you want. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's no shoulds. Eat whatever you want. And then you get to make the conscious choice of, do I want to eat that? Oh, if I can eat whatever I want, whenever I want, I'm actually going to make a choice now instead of, oh, I'm not allowed, I'm not allowed, I'm not allowed. Oh, the food's here. Let's go crazy. Like that is how dieting works. It's that mindset that um, like the saying rules are m made to be broken is there for a reason because you give yourself food rules. I don't know anyone who can joyfully follow a diet long term. Like it's just not a thing human bodies can do. Um, so that's, what's really interesting about this work is that mindset. So for myself, I was restricting, I was trying to be really good, like not eat carbs and only eat clean food in quotations and all these like low calorie and try to stay thin and eat to change my body size. And then I'd binge on the weekend. Oh, something's wrong with me. Why can't I binge? The binging is the problem. I got to fix this binge eating. And then it started again on Monday. And then that, the next weekend I had a binge. And it's like this cycle. And it's like, what's wrong with me? I just got to stop binging. It's like, take a step back and realize that whole week of not eating enough is what causes the binging. The binging is not a problem on its own. It's caused by not eating enough in the first place. So I soon started to realize, like, I can't do this anymore. I'm exhausted. It's been a decade of up and down and yo-yoing weight and trying to be good enough and not one day feeling like I was there. What is the point of all this? So I just started allowing myself to eat more. If I go somewhere and there's chips there, I'll just, if I want some, I'll eat them. And I just started becoming a bit more relaxed with my food choices. And if, if I'm having a burger I can have the bun I don't have to always wrap it in lettuce and just like easing off a little bit but what is what was that do you remember the point where 
it was like, okay, this is the least I've, this is the, the least I've enjoyed my body. And I have to make a change about, I have to do something. And do you remember what it was that you changed? Because I know a lot of people who have body issue problems. And, and in my space, it's kind of weird to say athletes too, because they're always active. And people think of athletes as the people who are the prime when it comes to diet and all these things. But there's a lot of us that we don't have that same relationship. But at the same time, there's also kids out there who are not happy with their bodies. So how did you switch it? What was the thing that happened? Was there a day? Was there a person you spoke to? Was there something you read? that said, okay, this is, you're not having, you don't have a healthy relationship with food. You have to change. Well, for sure. I mean, looking back now, I can see like what an annoying person I was. I can't go here. I can't go to that restaurant or I'd go out with my friends and I'd have tea and they'd all eat dinner. And like, I was so, thought I was so great at the time. So looking back, I can see a lot of issues with my relationship with food. It really hindered my social life. It hindered my ability to be in the world because everything has to be perfect you bring your tupperware meal to family dinner like that's not no normal. way wow <laughs> yeah like that's not healthy and so and so looking back those are all very big red flags um but the like my my own aha moment there was two one was of course if you're obsessed with your body what else are you going to do i was doing health coaching with a very prominent multi-level marketing company and promoting the workouts and the shakes and everything um, because that'll keep me more accountable and I'll be extra healthy if I'm doing it online and so I remember tying my shoelaces to go do one of the workouts in my dark cold basement and I was like I don't want to do this and I felt like a little kid having a tantrum like oh I'm tired I don't want to and I really had the first realization of I don't have to I'm the only person who forces me to do all this crap, (laughs) all these intense workouts every day, all this way of eating, like nobody else cares if I'm doing this but me. And so I realized I had the power to to make a decision um, to not. And then also the next thing that really made me realize, am I ever going to be happy? was I was getting ready to go on a trip to Mexico with my now husband and his parents. So people that love me, I don't need to be showing off or anything, but I was still like trying on bathing suits and thinking, okay, if I just lose five pounds here, if I just work out a little extra hard before the trip, it's going to be so fun. I was like, I have never gotten ready for a trip or or an event and thought, and like, I'm thinking more about the way I look than the trip. Like that's, and I, and that's not healthy. Like that is not normal. That is what culture teaches us that you have to look a certain way every time you're in a bathing suit and it's going to be the most fun and you're going to be the happiest if you look a certain way. And I really realized like, okay, like I've lost weight. I've kept it off. I've like yo-yoed, but I've been very thin and I still always was wanting more. And I think that's with, with a lot of things. Like I was watching a video the other day of celebrities saying like, yeah, you think, oh, I'm going to have that success and fame and you're going to be happy. And you're like, yeah, I made it. I'm there. But they're like, it's never feels that way. It's always, I want more. I need more. You need that next level. It's the same with when you're trying to control the way your body looks. It's never good enough. If that's it's, your focus and you think that's going to give you worthiness, you think you're going to be good enough if you look a certain way. Well, oh, I lost that weight, but it didn't really do what I thought it would. Oh, maybe if I just lose 10 pounds more and then it's never ending. And so I really had a moment of, if I'm not happy now, like, is this the thing I've been working so hard for? Like, why am I doing this? And then I really started just questioning myself because we, all these things that were taught of, you should always be pursuing weight loss, especially if you're in a larger body. Um, And if you're not, you're lazy. And you should you can control your body size and how you eat. And if you don't, if you can't, there's something wrong with you. And so we don't question that. So we're thinking, of course, there's just something. I just got to try the next diet. I just got to try the next diet. Oh, that one didn't work. I just got to try this one. And so we work with women who've been doing that for 10, 20, 30 years. You think we'd catch on that it's not working? No, but never, <laughs> it, it's always been. And, and the way I look at it, though, is you know we always think that everybody there's this 
thing I read recently, we always think that everybody's looking at us and people are always judging everything we do. And so when you're talking about standing in front of the mirror, trying on a video, so you think that everybody is coming to the beach and they're gonna be wondering why I didn't lo lose this five pounds. And part of this conversation is also, and from what I'm hearing, correct me if I'm wrong, is there was a, there was a point where it was more about the love of the body than it was about whatever goal it was. And so that love, if you don't love your body as it is right now, you're not gonna love it when you do whatever it is, whatever diet you try, when whatever, how many, however many pounds you lose, you're never going to love it at that point either because it's never going to be enough. So the message is love your body mm. as it is. And, and I think, exactly, and I think the important thing to realize with that is love doesn't mean you love the way it looks mm. love is like for a parent yeah you love them doesn't mean you love the way they look doesn't mean you love everything they do doesn't mean you love everything they say but it's like unconditional love of this is the only home i have you have one body this is it this is the physical being allowing you to be on this earth and let's just take care of it as it is and if and i think realizing Focusing on health and taking care of your body is a different thing than pursuing weight loss. Because, yeah, maybe you, you've never moved your body much and you want to feel better and you just are in a rut and you're not feeling good. That's fine. No one's saying, yeah, just suck it up and that's your life. No, do things that make you feel good. Start going for walks or find fitness that you love or get a trainer to make you so you can learn things and you don't feel scared to go work out if that's what you want to try out do all those things add vegetables into your meals so it feels good no one's saying don't do that but if you're only doing those things to lose weight the minute you're not losing weight you're gonna go oh screw it it's not working like moving your body and eating nourishing foods is great no matter your size mm -hmm. so well, and then, of course, still have all the delicious foods you love and don't restrict them and just listen to your body. That's all we teach. But our society really has a messed up view of that weight equals health. And so a lot of people will say, oh, but it's not about the way I look. I'm doing it for my health. Well, the research really shows that weight does not equal health. There are plenty of people in fat bodies who are healthy and lots of people in thin bodies who are unhealthy. So it's like, just focus on your wellness, meaning how do I feel? What do I do that makes me feel good? Uh, how am I taking care of myself? Am I resting? Am I getting enough sleep? Am I moving my body? Am I getting all different kinds of nutrients? Am I happy? Do I have good relationships? That is all health. And then your body is just going to do what your body's going to do. So for me, that meant gaining weight because I was made myself very thin by not eating enough food. So yeah, when I eat more food, I gain some weight. But I'm healthier than I've ever been. I'm happier than I've ever been. And my whole life isn't about looking a certain way. And I think that's really powerful to realize that you can be happy, content, fulfilled, and feel totally whole as you are. There's nothing you need to do on the outside to get that feeling it's like internal work to get those results that I really think that's why we're all doing this crazy stuff to lose weight is to have some deeper feelings. It's not just about the size of your jeans. It's about day, us. you want to feel good. You want to be happy. Yeah. And yeah, I want to be happy and I want to be loved and I want to be accepted and I want to be worthy and I want to be good enough and I want to be successful and I want to be content and confident it's like none of that comes from a body size but that's what diet culture has told us that's what we see in advertising it's always thin people it's being so happy on a boat drinking some drink that they're advertising and it really has been subliminally subliminally and very overtly told to us that hey look at this before and after picture look how much happier she is after um, and we actually have a documentary coming out called behind the before and after um, really sh shedding a light on the things that go on behind the scenes of, of a before and after because there's a lot of disordered things going on. There's a lot of misery and shame and 
never feeling good enough, and it's not the pretty picture that it's made out to be. When you're, tell me about when you're having a bad day, because one thing I've learned about self-work, self-improvement is it's never, you're never done with that work. You're still going to have days where you're like, man, I don't feel that good. Tell me about what, what you do to make yourself feel better. Absolutely. Well, the good news is that my bad days are rarely about the way my body looks. And that used to rule my mood. Like if I woke up and I weighed more, oh my gosh, what a horrible day. Or if I felt like my jeans were too tight, that would ruin everything. So my, any sort of rough part of life is not about the way I look anymore, which is saying a lot because that used to rule me when, before I had children, before I had two C-sections that, and my stomach will never look the same, <laughs> before all this stuff where I was in the body that society says is a good body. And I was miserable. And now ah, I'm still, I still have been privileged. I still have a lot of stuff uh, that puts me in a place where this work is easier. Obviously, if you're in a fat body and you're trying to accept your body, uh, society does make that harder for you, but it's still possible. Um, but yeah, I have two kids under two in a pandemic um while in oh, grad school fun household right yeah, now <laughs> grad school for psychology and working from home wow. it's it's a tough time it's really really tough so i mean rest taking breaks that's huge for me is realizing my mental health is so much more important than making the perfect dinner so it's like if i have to have a dinner of convenience to keep me sane i'm going to do it and like having chicken nuggets one night <laughs> is not going to ruin me but but if i have to cook a really intensive meal after a crazy long day that might send me over the edge so it's like i really realize that like the food i eat and the exercise i do is not as important as i once thought it was of course it's a part of my life it's something that does make me feel good physically um, and I do listen to my body, but I also have a very big understanding that life has a lot of things that are important other than that. And so uh, it's been it's been so good in this time of life. Like this year has been so really tough. And to not have my weight and food and workouts be another stressor on top of that. I couldn't imagine going through this time of my life with that on top of my shoulders as well. So it, it has been really helpful to know like, okay, what I eat and how I work out and what I weigh right now is not the most important thing. <laughs> Getting through the day and like you said, how do I feel better? It's like just when the kids are in bed, then I just have my relaxing time. I don't put any extra stress on myself. I'm, I'm not going to say, okay, now I have to go work out. It's like, look, I just had 12 hours of working and doing schoolwork with the kids around. <laughs> I need a break and allowing myself that rest. I think our culture is a very go, 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 go very type of one. So. And yes. Yeah. And even, oh, you're, you're in quarantine at home. Great. You have all this extra time now to lose weight and get fit. It's like, sorry. I'm not, that's not my concern right now. Um, when, um, when the quarantine started, I think that I was one of those people for sure. Um, but my relationship with working out is, is different. So working out makes me feel good. I have to move. Like I, I realized that I don't, the, the dieting part is important for me because I need the right fuels to be the athlete that I want to be. But at the same time, I'm also, I'm educating myself on how much to rest as well, because all these things play together. I realized, and, and these are things that I've learned from, from like the time I was a, a younger man, um, someone told me you're not supposed to eat after eight o'clock. And I'm like, yo, what are you talking about? I, I eat at midnight, I'm fine. I can do. And then I start to read about it and I start to educate myself about why and what it does for your sleep and your healing. And I think that with more education, you get to have a good relationship. And so what is your, I guess the, the perspective shift, if you were to, somebody came to you, let's say a young guy says, I'm anorexic. 
because I don't want to eat to get fat or I don't, you know, I don't have a healthy relationship. How do you change people's perspective? Because I realize for me, that's what's helping me to, to move forward, to have a healthy relationship with all of it, with sleep, with mm-hmm. food and with, with exercise. Well, it, it's tough and it is different. I mean, obviously, if, if that's what works for you and you feel great and you don't see any adverse effects from that, like I, we are not ever here to say people should do this, people should do what we do. And even if you're happy, no, what you're doing is wrong, what we're doing is right. Um, what we are here for is for people to say, oh, I've been doing the old model of having those rules of don't eat after eight and I feel like I'm going crazy and I'm binge eating, and I'm all I ever focus is on my weight, and I'm obsessed with the way my body looks, that's the person we're talking to. So if that's what works for you, great. But for me, if I'm hungry at nine, I'm going to freaking eat something. Like I'm not going to go to bed hungry because some study says that it's going to ruin my sleep. What we really help tell people to do who are kind of wanting to do this work is, okay, take in the information, take in the science and the research, but also decide well is that that true for me because if me going to bed hungry every night is what the what the research says well that doesn't work for me because I'm not going to sleep well if I'm hungry so I'll have a snack before bed if I'm hungry and so I think really people need to also have their own mind and make their own choices as well because there's research out there saying the opposite like carnivore diet or vegan both these things are going to save your life it's like well those are opposites so how can that both be true i saw I really think- grandma sorry to interrupt you i saw this grandma who was 109 years old and they asked her the secret and she said she ate meat and drank beer and i thought that was the most fascinating thing it will blow everybody's mind in california because they're like no <laughs> everything they're there again sorry to interrupt you <laughs> no totally and that's what That's what's so interesting is if you just take, okay, we're not robots. So you can't take all this data from studies and say, okay, this is how I should function. It's like, we're not all the same. We're all very different. What works for one person is not going to work for another. And what we have found, particularly because we only work with women, so I can only speak to that. But for women who have been focusing on their weight their whole lives, they're heavier than when they started. They're like, what the hell? When I was 20, I thought I was fat. Look how good I looked. And that's how, like, everyone has the same story of what was I thinking? Well, it's the same thing now. It's like in 20 years, you're gonna be like, oh, I was so young. What was I thinking? There wasn't any problems. So I think to have food education, I mean, is good, I guess, in the very basic sense of like, yeah, there's different food groups eat from all the different food groups because you need various nutrients can't just eat one thing and be healthy because you need the vitamins and minerals and nutrients from a wide variety of food but past that I find it can kind of dull our intuition which is what we teach is intuitive eating so if someone thinks well this food's really bad for me so you never eat it but you're obsessed with it and then you just end up binging on it it's like well Maybe for me, allowing that food and eating it is going to serve me best because if I don't, it results in these things. Because a lot of things that food studies don't don't um, a lot for or account for um, is the negative repercussions of that. So say a food study says chocolate is really bad for you. You should never eat it. Okay, that's what the study says. So now everyone's taking it super seriously and they're saying, okay, I'm never going to eat chocolate. But then the the negative repercussions from that are people now are obsessed with chocolate people now are binging on chocolate if that's what you love um or more specifically what better example would be to eat x amount of calories a day that's what this study says this is the optimal amount of calories you should eat every day okay well how does that affect people has it how does it affect their mental health how does it affect their physical health how does it affect the way they eat because they're now binging instead of like they're dieting and then binging so they're now in a cycle they are now so preoccupied with food they can barely focus at work like these things are never talked about it's just the science and then never the human element of it which biology is really important to understand on a whole and so if if a person is focusing too much on just the research and the science 
we can get really stuck in a place of food fear, being very afraid of food, thinking, oh, this food's going to kill me and this one's going to save me. It's like food just does not have that much power. Of course, we can, we can eat a wide variety of foods. We can feel good and nourish our bodies. But that, the minute, like trying to micromanage everything is not going to save us. Yeah, I, I agree with you about the fact that if somebody tells you, don't do this, that's all you want to do. So having a diet is not about telling people what not to do because for everybody, it doesn't matter what it is. Don't think about a pink elephant. That's the first <laughs> yeah. thing to think about. Thank you so much. I, I really, what I want to know, uh, and I have a couple more questions, but I want to know young Jenna. So you're talking to her right now and you're trying to explain to her and she's going through her stages of life. What do you tell her? What do you tell her about food? Um, well, I mean, everyone's issues with food stems from an issue with their body. Because if food didn't affect the way we look, no one would care. <laughs> we would all just eat whatever. And if you didn't feel good, you would eat something different and it would be intuitive. Um, so the real issue is with our relationship with weight and with our bodies. So I would tell myself that if you have to work this hard to look this way, it's not worth it. And that if you have to look this way to be accepted, those aren't your people. Because who would want that anyway? It's like even now I'm luckily with a with my partner who after having two babies and two C-sections and not dieting anymore, yeah, I look different than when we met and he does not care at all. I wouldn't want someone who does care. So why am I working so hard to look a certain way when the person I would want to be with, I wouldn't want them to need me to look this way because that's an exhausting life. <laughs> so I would tell myself to just live and not try to work so hard to quote unquote fit in but instead to find the right people that I already fit in with. Because you can't, you can't mold yourself into someone else and have a good life because you know it's not authentic, it's not sustainable, and it's not real. And that never gives you the contentment and peace you think it will. It's always about the mindset and the internal work that can give you that. For, for everybody who's listening, at the end of the day, it's all about you paying attention to yourself. All this, the happiness truly comes from inside of you. Whatever you eat doesn't change that. It doesn't, you, you, have to, you have to eat what makes you feel good, what makes you feel happy. And when you vibrate high, which is what I'm, I'm aiming for with this and with everything that I do is to, I want to vibrate positivity and all these things. And when you're at a high vibration, you attract the things to you that you want. And it's a, it's a cycle then. It's like, okay, you're doing the things that make you happy. You're happy. And the people see you happy. And they, it's like this cycle of, of happiness that we're, we're all so lacking right now. So thank you for this awareness. What is your ultimate goal with diet awareness? Um, it is that diet culture doesn't exist anymore. And we realize food is not a tool to control how we look but just something to fuel us and that hunger is just a body signal just like having to pee <laughs> it should be that neutral of oh i'm hungry i'm gonna eat duh but it's not that way we have such a complicated relationship with it and it not to be dramatic but it really ruins people's lives like when you're 80 years old and we've had clients who's like my mom texted me She's 85 and she baked cookies and she feels so bad because she ate some of them. Like, can we not? <laughs> I don't want to be an 85-year-old grandmother who's worried, <laughs> worried about eating cookies. Like, that's so sad. And so the, the, the minute someone has that moment of, yeah, obsessing over my weight my whole life really has been detrimental. It hasn't gotten me anywhere. Um, maybe there is an alternative. And it would be great to, to show the value of a healthy relationship with food and not just food fear, because especially in North America, we are so afraid of like, what's the right thing to eat? What's the wrong thing to eat? Where like, it's so awesome to go, well, 
once we can travel again, <laughs> to go on mm-hmm. vacation and just enjoy the food there. Just enjoy the local food and eat and love it instead of, oh, God, be really good before I go on my trip. And then I'm going to eat everything I can see. And then I'll be really good when I get home. Like just living and eating normally and having that be uh, enjoyable but small part of your life uh, can really change things for a lot of people physically and mentally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are working on rebuilding our diets and the way we look at, at food and the culture of the diet. Um, there's, a, there's a funny anecdote that I heard once where they said that the, is it the Jamaicans, they don't say diets because it has dye in it. And so they rather say livets because they, they, they want to eat things that make you live and sustain your health. So along those same lines, I think that that's the way we should look at food. It's the things that make us feel good, the things that, that sustain us. And, and I think this, the, the diet conversation should continue. Thank you so much for, for enlightening all of us. Even I have some things to think about myself as well. So thank you, Jenna. I appreciate you. Where can we, where can we hear more of your, um, your positive messages? Where can we hear more of you and see more of you? Uh, you can find us at thebodylovesociety.com and we are Instagram. We are at the Body Love Society and we have a documentary coming out in 2021 called Behind the Before and After. Our obsession with weight loss is anything but healthy. Wow. Bodylovesociety.com. Thank you so much, Jenna. Thank you.